finish up the rest of the step with regression um, and we don't have enough time to do it synchronously so I'm going to uh, just do this with a video. Um, so one of the other activities I like to do with uh, linear regression is the Barbie bungee jumping and um, I'm going to preface this by saying that this um, activity is it's a fun activity. I would say that it's not an activity that you really want to teach them any concepts or really uh, it kind of reinforces some things we don't want them to do. Um, but I know a lot of people do this activity, and um, let me just explain how it works. Um, so what we do with the Barbie bungee jump is we, first of all, we tie a, a single rubber band around uh, a Barbie doll's ankles. And then we, before you do that, stretch the rubber band out a little bit so that you're you know pulling on it like this, and then um, get it stretched out tie it onto her ankles, and then you're going to have her fall off of a ledge. And when she falls, you want to have a tape measure there and see how far does her head reach before she pops back up. All right? And then we're going to record that number here in the table. All right? And then we're going to attach a second rubber band and do the same thing. How far does she fall? All right? And then a third and a fourth and a fifth. All right? And when you do that, you're going to find that these five ordered pairs give you a very linear pattern, right? And so when we complete the table, uh, we plot the points, and we find the least squares regression line two different ways. We do distance as a function of the rubber, number of rubber bands. We find the R and the R squared. And then we reverse the roles of rubber bands and distance and calculate the R and the R squared again. All right, what students should realize is that these numbers are going to be the same. The R and the R squared are the same no matter which way you do the linear regression. All right, now, the reason I do this is because what we want to be able to do is put a distance in to our function and be able to work backwards and find out how many rubber bands does it take. And one thing, it, it took me several years before I really realized this, but if you take these two equations and you reverse the roles of x and y, you don't necessarily get exactly the inverse of uh, the, the first function. Okay. In other words, if you take this equation and you, and you switch to the roles of x and y and then solve for y again, you're not going to get this exact same equation. All right. It does work really closely here because the, cor the correlation coefficient is really, really close to 1. All right. So then we want to interpret the slope uh, for each equation. So for this one, it would be inches per rubber band. And then for this one down here would be number of rubber bands per inch that she's going to fall. Uh, the y-intercept in each case. Um, so this one, the y-intercept would be the distance that she drops with, with zero rubber bands. Now, when we think about zero rubber bands, some kids will say, well, that means she's going to just like fall right to the floor. No, it really means a, a rubber band of zero length. So the y-intercept in this case ends up being very close to how tall the Barbie is. Okay. Um, when you come down to this one, the y-intercept is um, the number of rubber bands for her to fall a, a zero distance. All right. This one should end up giving you kind of a negative number. All right. And the reason it ends up being a negative number is because if her head is at you know the, the level of the platform, that means her feet have to be up above her. All right. And so you're going to end up with a negative uh, y-intercept on this one. Okay, so interpret the R squared. Okay, so there's going to be some variation here in these numbers, and we're going to find that the correlation coefficient and the R squared are very, very high. All right, so let's just say R squared is like 99%. That means that 99% of the variation in these numbers up here, in other words, the distance that she drops, can be attributed to a linear relationship to the number of rubber bands. Okay, so almost all that variation could be explained away by the number of rubber bands attached to her. All right, and then what we do is we go down to the gym, and I've got a, a platform in the gym that I know is 196 inches above the gym floor. Um, and what we want to do is take this second equation and work backwards and say, all right, if I want her to drop 196 inches, how many rubber bands do I need? All right, and then we actually go down to the gym and, and we throw her off the balcony and see who can get the closest to hitting the ground without actually hitting her head on the ground. So I did this in a workshop uh, a couple years ago. I think this was at Carleton. Um, and we had 
we had four different groups do them at the same time, right? And I think they did this one in slow motion. And so you can see that the two on the left there were pretty close. The, the dark haired one actually hit the ground, but the one with the blonde ponytail came really close. And so we have a little contest and I'll tell you that kids have a lot of fun doing this. All right, the problem with this one though is it takes about, it takes about 17 rubber bands to um, 17 or so for her to reach a, a distance of about 196 inches. And so if you think about, well, what are we doing here? We're, we're going from one to five and then we're extrapolating out to 17 rubber bands. And that's something that I really don't want my students to think is a, a proper thing to do, All right? Even though it did work pretty well here that the number of rubber bands and the distance is a very strong linear relationship, even when you extend out beyond, you know, like four or five rubber bands. Okay, so that's a fun activity. It's a, it, it's a great activity to do when uh, the principal or whoever is coming to observe you. Um, they always like to see kids having fun and, and doing math and having a little challenge as well. So the other ones I want to look at is um, the nonlinear models. Um, and I'm going to also preference this by saying that if your students are not very strong and you feel like in order for you to really talk about logarithms and exponential functions, um, you've got to spend like a whole day reviewing what's a logarithm, how do they work, uh, uh, what makes them inverses of each other, and things like that. So what I did here is, I did this earlier today, and I, I'm modeling the idea of, of population growth. And in this activity, we're going to say that your population starts out with 10, I'm just calling them organisms. And at the end of every generation, so at the end of every certain number of days or whatever, each organism rolls a die. And if they roll a six, the organism gets to reproduce uh, in a manner that's like cell division. So two or one organism splits and becomes two organisms, and none of the organisms ever die. All right, so the problem is with advanced algebra classes and, and pre-calc classes, generally they don't talk about a model and then having some error kind of built into the model as well. But in statistics, again, we, we like to uh, kind of embrace that variability. All right, so um, what I've done here is this is the way that I simulated the population growth. And what I did is I said, let's roll a die 10 times, and then we want to count how many sixes there are. So if I go to math, probability, randint, okay, and I'm going from one to six, okay, lower bound and upper bound, and I want to roll 10 of them, whoops, 10 of them, okay, and it gives me a string. So as I go across here, I see there's a six, and if I scroll over, I see that that's the only six in the list. So my population just grew by one, okay? All right, so then the next thing I do is I call up that same command. My population is now no longer 10, now it's 11, right? So it might be like this one, All right? So I change that to an 11, I roll them again, and I count how many sixes there are. Okay, so when you roll this like seven or eight times, you can see that these numbers get kind of big. So what I've also done is I've streamlined this a little bit by embedding this in another formula. So if you go to second stat math, sum, and then inside here I'm going to do math probability randit 1 comma 6 comma, I'm going to start over at 10 again, okay, and then I'm going to hit second math, second math gives me the uh, test menu, and I'm just going to say equals 6, okay, so this randit 1, 6, 10 is going to roll 10 dice, it's going to compare it to 6, this is going to generate a list of zeros and ones, and then I'm going to add them all up, and that's going to tell me how many sixes were in the list. All right, I think I've got an extra parenthesis there. Okay, so when I hit enter here, I got zero. All right, so that might be like what happened to member number four here. Okay, so second generation, he's still got ten people. He's going to roll it again. All right, this time he got three. All right, so this would go from ten to thirteen. So I hit second enter and I go back and now I'm going to increase my population to 13. Okay, and then I got three more. 
So I'm going to write down 16. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to have 16 organisms reproduce. And I got three again, so now I'm at 19. Right? This generally doesn't grow linearly like that. But um, so there, I got four. All right, so that's what I did. And I just kept track of the population growth here. All right, and so what if I did this with my students, I would just have them fill in one of these columns. And then I would say, all right, pair up with four other people in the class. And then you're going to take the values that you've got and you're going to average them. All right, and so they average their population growth over here. And again, what happens here is you can see a lot of variability here. Like this first one got up to 58, whereas these over here only got up to like 32 and 35. All right, and by the time you get to generation eight, you've got quite a bit of variability here because of what happened previously. All right, but if you look at any of these individually, they don't really seem to grow exponentially, not quite like I would expect them to. All right, so that's why I average the data and do it with the average data instead. Okay, so first thing I want to do is find the least squares regression line for the mean population versus generation. All right, so we're talking about this is my Y's and this is my X's. All right, so if I go back to my calculator and I go to Stat, Edit, okay, we've got generation starts out at zero and we go up to eight generations. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. And then I'm gonna go over here to list two and I'm gonna put in the average population. So 11.8, 14.8, 16 16.8, 20.4, 26.2, 29.6, 34.4, and 40.6. And I'm off one. Oh, that's because we got to start at 10. All right, so I'm going to put the cursor at the first one there if I hit second insert it'll insert a number and it'll push everything else down so i don't have to retype everything okay so there i've got nine ordered pairs okay i'm going to go to second y equals i'm going to turn the stat plot on and i want a scatter plot of list one and list two and when i zoom nine there's what i get i've got some other line turned on there all right so i'm going to get rid of that and then graph it again Okay, so a couple of things that I want to look at here is, first of all, that looks like a pretty strong uh, positive association, right? And you might be able to tell by looking at it that it doesn't quite look like it's linear, right? But the first thing I'm going to do is go to stat, calc, choice number eight. I've got my stat wizard turned off, and, and it's just list one is the X list, list two is the Y list. And then remember to get the Y1, if you hit alpha, trace, you'll get Y1. Okay, so there's my equation. All right, then I'm going to go back and look at the graph. And the graph looks like that. All right, and you can see that the linear model is not bad, but it looks like I've got a couple of points that are too high, and then a couple of points that are too low, and then a couple of points that are too high again. And I'm thinking about the residuals here. The residuals start out positive and then negative and then positive again. And I can't remember if last week we talked about what kinds of patterns in the residual plot we're looking for, or that a residual plot just means that we're going to take this graph and imagine that the points that have positive residuals, the points that are above the line, imagine that they're attached to the line with uh, their helium balloons. And then these that have negative residuals are hanging by a weight. And then we're just going to take the line and all the points and collapse them down to the horizontal axis. And that's what a residual plot is. All right now, if I go back to um, second y equals, I'd like to look at that residual plot. So I go down to my x list and my y list. All right, and I've done this about mm, three or four times already this summer. And I don't remember if we did this on Wednesday or not. I'm going to go to my y list and I'm going to change that to the residuals. Right. And if you go under its second stat, and if you go under this menu, under the names, you'll find a list that's called Resid. Right. And Resid is a list that gets updated every time you do any kind of regression. It's going to recalculate these residuals and store them in this list. All right. So if I look at uh, a residual plot, 
I'm going to go back to here and hit zoom 9 again. And there's my residual plot. Okay, It's more pronounced here that you see a couple of positive residuals, some negative residuals, and then some positive residuals. But this is definitely a pattern. Okay, I, I see kind of a parabolic pattern here. All right, which means that the data isn't really linear. All right, so what we'd like to be able to do is say, is a linear model appropriate model for predicting population from generation? And I would say it's not bad, but it's probably not the appropriate method. It's probably there's going to be something that's not linear. Okay, so here's what we do. We're going to transform this data. All right, and again, this is something that if your students are a little bit weak and they kind of remember logarithms, you may say, you know, you can probably just put your pin down here or follow along with me. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the log of the populations. All right, so I'm going to go back to stat, edit. And instead of just looking at the population versus the number of years, I want to take their logarithms. And it doesn't matter if you use natural log or if you use common log. All right, I'm going to use common log. And this is going to be the log of what's in this 2. All right, and then so these are the logs. And if we kind of scroll down, we see that those numbers are all between 1 and 2. And it might give you an opportunity to talk about logarithms again. Why is the log of 10 equal to 1? Because 10 to the first power is 1. How come these numbers are no bigger than 2? Because log of 100 is 2, and these numbers are all less than 100. Okay, so what I want to look at is how does list 1 and list 3 compare then? So first, I'm going to go to second y equals, and I'm going to look at a graphical display of those two. Okay, and zoom 9. All right, and now I see something that looks like a very linear pattern. And in fact, um, if I fit a linear pattern to this one, or a linear model, I'm going to go to stat, calc, number 8, and it's list 1, but now we're going to do it against the logs of list 2, which are in list 3. And then I'm going to store that equation in y1. Okay, so we end up with this. And if I go back and look at the graph again, okay, that line looks like a pretty good fit. And I can also kind of imagine what the residual plot looks like here. This one looks like the residual is about zero, and then a little bit negative, a little bit positive, a little bit negative, a little negative, positive, and so on. All right? And I'm kind of imagining that the residual plot now doesn't have that same parabolic pattern in it. Okay, so I want to go back and I, I want to look at the equation that I got. So there's my equation. And this is not y versus x, but it is... And I'm going to just use, um, instead of using population mean and using generation, I'm going to use just, this is my y's and these are my x's. So it's really not y, it's log of y is equal to, and then um, my x's, the equation is 1.003, okay, plus um, 0.0773. And then times x. Okay, x is the number of generations that have passed, and y is the population. And to be precise, I think there should probably be a, a hat on top of this. Okay, so this one next. So the, that that's the answer then. Is a linear model appropriate here? And a linear model would be appropriate here because there is no there's no pattern in the residual plot. Okay, and then this one should say number three. Use the model found in number three to predict the population at the end of generation 12 when t is equal to 13. All right, so what I want you to do then is say the log of y is equal to 1.003 plus 0 0.0773 times, and then this would be 13. All right, so we're going to get log of y on this side is equal to 1.003 plus 0 0.0773 times 13, and that gives me 2.008. All right, so if the log of y is 2.008, that means that y is equal to 10 raised to the 2.008, which 
which this answer is going to be slightly bigger than 100. All right, so 10 raised to the 2.008 is 101.8 or so. All right, I'm, going to, I'm just going to call it 102. It's about 102. Okay, so then what we'd like to be able to do is come back and, and come up with a model for this that's not linear. Okay, so if we go back to this again, should say number three, we want to take this equation, I want to solve it for y. All right, so if you start out with this equation and you solve this for y, we're going to get that y is equal to 10 raised to this power. All right, so 1.003 plus 0.0773 times x. All right, I also like going through this activity because I know that some of you teach other things besides stats, and so if you're teaching a pre-calc class and you're doing stuff with logarithms and exponential functions, this is a, a nice activity to go through. Okay, and so if we use my laws of logarithms again, we're going to get y equals. Um, I'm adding two things in the exponent here, which means I'm multiplying 1.0 or 10 to the 1.003 times 10 raised to the 0 0.0. 773 times x. Alright, and then I'm going to substitute in here. So 10 raised to the 1.003 is 10.07. And then if you take this and you put parentheses around this, this is 10 raised to the 0 0.0773, then raised to the x power. All right, so if I take 10 and raise it to the 0 0.0773 power, I get about 1.19. Okay, and then raise to the x. Okay, so if you think um, this equation is in the form of a times b raised to the t power. Okay, this is my population size. And if you think about um, what students should probably already know about population growth is that this value of A is the y-intercept. Okay, and that's the initial population. And if you think, well, this is 10 or about 10, and all of our populations did start at 10, so it kind of makes sense that that would be true. And then also if you're using this to model population growth, this is really going to be like the initial population. And then this value of B is really like 1 plus the growth rate raised to the t power. So it looks like our model kind of sets the growth rate at about 19%. All right, and if you think about the, the nature of this problem, we're rolling a die, and we'd expect that about one out of six organisms are going to reproduce, okay, because we're rolling a die, and the chance of you reproducing is one out of six. We'd expect that the, uh, the growth rate would be one-sixth, and one-sixth is about 16 or 17 percent. So we're, we're off just slightly here. Okay, so this gives me a model that is exponential. Now what I want to do is go back and I want to use this model along with my original scatter plot. Okay, so if I go back to second y equals, um, I want to look at list one and list two. Okay, and then I'd also like to go back to y equals. I'm going to clear out the function that I had in there and replace it with 10.07, 10.07 times 1.19 raised to the x power. Okay, and when I hit graph, whoops, I should hit, uh, it's going to take a second here. I'm going to hit um, zoom 9 instead. All right, and so I see, again, my original scatter plot, and then I see this um, exponential function that fits pretty well in there. Okay, now another thing that shows up, or another thing that kids will probably recognize, is if you go into this menu and you go down to exponential regression, and I just put in list 1 and I put in list 2, and I say put this in... I'm going to say put this in Y2, okay, hit enter, all right, and it gives me that same equation here with a little bit of rounding error, okay, so it's, it's in the form of A times B to the X power, A is about 10.07, B is about 1.19, 
and then it tells me that R and R squared are pretty close to 100%. All right now, these two values of R and R squared do not measure the strength of the exponential regression. It actually measures the strength of this linear model up here. All right, I probably at this point should have written down what R and R squared are when I did this step up here. Okay, in fact, um, in fact, if you do that, you're going to get exactly the same numbers you see here on the screen. Okay. So the numbers you see here tell me how good the linear fit is here with x versus the log of the y's. Okay, so that's, um, I think, a, a kind of a neat activity to do for nonlinear regression. I think if there's anything that you want to cut out of your teaching, this is one of the things that you can probably cut out. Okay, and then if you look at the, the next one, um, these are a bunch of concentric circles. And I've got... Um, some pictures I want to pull up here that I, I did earlier today. So, oh, where did I put those on the desktop? Okay. Um, I don't put them on the good spot. Let's see. Oh, one second. And now I don't see them there. Let's see. Maybe I'll put them in this other folder. Hang on one second. I didn't have these open ahead of time. So, um, okay, here they are. All right, so um, I took a bunch of these beads and I covered up uh, the first circle of diameter 2. And if you count the number of beads there, there are 23. All right? And then I went to the next circle and I covered that up as well as I could and I found out that there was 53 beads that covered up um, a circle of radius 3. And if I kept going on this, another one, and another one, and another one. Okay, and so I end up with the table being filled, um, filling up the table, right, with these values. Okay, and then I'm just going to tell you what happens on this one. Um, if you take the log of the x's and the log of the y's, okay, so what you do on the on the calculator is you would first say, let's do um, diameter versus the log of the y's. In fact, uh, we've got enough time. This is a video. If, you, if you're not interested in this, you can, you can fast forward through it. You can also stop this video if you, if you uh, get caught up in, in um, the steps that I'm doing. So I'm going to go to Stat, Edit. I'm going to replace list 1 with 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And I'm going to replace list 2 with the number of beats. 23, 53, 93, 147, and 215. Okay, and if I go back to second y equals, I want to look at, first of all, the scatter plot of these two, and I'm just going to zoom 9, and I should have shut off that function that was in there. But I think if you look closely on this one, you can see that that graph looks kind of linear, but it's a little bit concave upward yet. So if I do um, stat, oops, stat calc number eight, list one comma list two comma y one. Right there's my equation. There's my r and r squared. R is pretty close to one. 
And if I go back to the graph, there's what the graph looks like. And it looks to me like, again, the residual plot is going to look kind of like a smile. All right, so what we did on the last problem is we tried to get rid of that smile by taking the log of the y's, all right? So let me shut this, clear these out. I'm going to go back to stat edit. I'm going to jump over to list four, and I'm going to take the log of the number of beats. So this would be log of list two. Okay? Populates that with logarithms. And then what I want to look at is the relationship between the, uh, the, the size of the diameter and the log of the y's. Okay? So now I'm fitting a model to log of y is equal to, um, let's see, what does it become? So stat, calc, linear regression, no, yeah, linear regression, um, list one versus list three, and I want to store those in Y1. Oops. Fat fingers. Now what? No problem here in this three stat. Oh, it's not list three, it's list four. Okay, so we get this equation. The log of y is equal to, and the equation is 0 0.957 plus um, 0.238 times x, okay? And then once I've done that, then I want to go back and I want to look at the relationship between this linear model and the model after we've transformed the y's. So I'm going to go back to second y equals. I want to look at a plot of list one versus list four. Okay, list four is where the log of the y's are, right? And there's a reason why I skipped over to list four. You'll see that in just a second. Okay, and then if I hit um, zoom 9, okay, we get something that looks like this. All right, and I think if you look at the residual plot for this one, now that smile is now going to be a frown. Okay, so what happened is our data was initially concave upward. We took the log of the y's, and we did a linear regression on the log of the y's versus the x's. And what happened is our graph that was concave upward is now kind of overcompensated, and now it's concave downwards, okay? So we find out that this model it maybe is not the best model. Okay, the first textbook I, I taught out of, there was this thing called the Ladders of Transformations, and um, it was a nightmare to try to teach that to students, uh, especially if, they, if you kind of expected them to be able to remember um, or to memorize what to do. All right, I'm just going to tell you that I know what to do here. To fix this, I'm going to take the log of the x's also. Okay, so if I go to stat, edit, and I'm going to go to list 3, and in list 3 is going to be the log of the x's. That's the log of list 1. Okay, so then the next thing I want to look at is I want to fit a linear model with L3 and L4. Okay. So first, I'm going to go to set up my graph. So it's L3 versus L4. And then I'm going to uh, do a linear re regression. So stat, calc, 8, list 3 versus list 4. And we'll store that equation in Y1. Okay. All right, so something nice happens here. We get uh, A is 0.752, B is 2.02, and notice that the R and the R squared are pretty darn close to what? All right, and then if I graph this, I guess I need to do a zoom 9 instead of the graph. Zoom 9. Okay, I see that now this linear model is almost perfect. Okay, and I saw that with the R and the R squared. 
Okay, so let's go back here, and unfortunately it doesn't remember exactly what happened here, but if I hit second, enter, it'll redo it again. And so now this equation that we have is list three and list four. List four is the log of the y's is equal to 0.75, I'm going to call it 0.753, plus 2.0, three times, and it's not just the x's, it's the log of the x's. Okay, so then what I'd like to do is take this equation and solve it for y. So y is going to be equal to 10 raised to the 0 0.753 times 10, and I'm going to rewrite this a little bit differently and say 10 to the log of x and then raised to the 2.03 power. Okay, so I'm taking 10 raised to, um, to the sum is the product of 10 raised to this power and 10 raised to, and I just rewrote this backwards and, and then use my laws of logarithms. Okay, so then what I get is y equals 10 raised to the 0.753 That is about 5.66. And then times 10 raised to the log base 10 of x is really the same thing as x, and then raised to the 2.03 power. All right, so I end up, end up with something that looks like um, the number of beads. So y would be beads with a hat on it is equal to 5.66 times x is really the diameter here raised to the 2.03 power. Okay, so if you think, um, what does the, the 5.66 represent? It's really just a multiplier that gives me a way of measuring a relationship between the number of beads and area. All right, and so this 5.66 doesn't really have all that much meaning. It's just a way of, of, of translating from one measure to another. But we would expect, or if you think about it, I would hope that students would expect that this exponent on the diameter should be something close to 2. Because if you think we're trying to fit a number of beads in here, the number of beads is dependent upon the size of the circle. The size of the circle is area. Area of a circle is dependent upon the square of the radius, or you could also say it's dependent upon the square of the diameter, all right, with a, a multiplier out in front. Okay. All right, so again, when you look at the r and the r squared that shows up on your calculator when you do this regression, you're going to see that it is fairly close to 1, but it really measures the linear relationship between log of y and log of x. Okay, And then if we go back and we say, well, let's look at our initial equation or our initial graph. So I'm going to go back to the second y equals again. I'm going to make a scatter plot of list 1 and list 2. I'm going to go back to my equation and I'm going to replace it with 5.66 times x raised to the 2.03 power. And then I'm going to zoom 9. All right, and what we come up with is a really nice fitting model to the, um, it's a power model. All right, now, um, when kids are doing this, they may say, well, can't we just go to calc and go down to power regression and run a, a power regression with list 1 and list 2 and y1? And the answer is, yes, they, they can do that. Okay, and they're going to get the exact same equation. All right, so 5.66 times d raised to the 2.03 power. All right, we're off with a little bit of rounding. Okay, however, these questions that are going to be about nonlinear regression are, are probably going to show up somewhere in the multiple choice, um, and kids would have to be able to, like, answer the question based upon equations that have logarithms in them. All right, this is a lot of stuff that is not very easy for kids to wrap their minds around. And so, again, if it is something that you feel like you want to skip, I would say I, I've, I've skipped it most years. The only time I don't skip it is if I've got some kids that are, are really, really sharp math, mathematicians and they want a little bit more explanation. Okay? Um, 
And then the last thing here is, uh, this was, uh, I found this in an article. It, it was, uh, one of my friends shared it with me. But it's, um, the shows that spending patterns uh, at restaurants. So the level of spending in restaurants is, is, um, is down, like from 80 to down 30%. All right, so as you move left to right on this scale here, this is the amount of spending at restaurants. And then if you look at the vertical axis, the vertical axis is a change of new cases in the coronavirus. And so it looks like there is a slight positive association between an increase in spending at restaurants and the number of coronavirus cases that are, are new. All right, so the equation is here. So we'd expect kids to be able to do things like this. Um, describe the association in the scatter plot. I would say slightly positive. Okay, not necessarily all that strong. Okay, um, I would say moderately strong positive association. Okay, and I would say that linear is probably an appropriate method here as well. So fairly strong positive linear association. Interpret the slope. So this 3.2 is for every or for each additional increase of 1% spending in restaurants, the model predicts that the number of new cases is going to go up by about 3.2. All right, and this would be 3.2, and I think on the vertical axis it's um, number of cases per 100,000 or something like that. So we're going to get another 3.2 cases per 100,000 for each additional 1% spending at restaurants on average. Okay, uh, interpret the coefficient of determination. That's this R squared. So 38% of the variation in new cases can be attributed to a linear relationship to the um, increase in spending at restaurants. Okay, and then this last thing is something that we would do at the very end of the course, talking about um, inference for the slope of the regression. Okay, you're going to get a, a T statistic of 5.02. All right, so that's assuming that there's no relationship between these two variables, that the likelihood of me getting a, a, a slope from a sample uh, that is 3.2 or larger is going to, is a very rare occurrence. Okay, if you get a T score of 5.02, that's like a Z score of 5.02. It's number of standard deviations above the mean. Okay. So that um, is the extra stuff that I would like you guys to um, know about um, linear regression. Um, and then I'm going to also um, put out another video that has to do with some probability stuff that we're going to do tonight. So as I say tonight, you're going to watch this video probably later. Um, and, um, and then I've got a, an assignment that I'm, I'm going to have you guys do as well. I'll talk about that tonight as we're, as we're doing the webinar. Okay. So um, I hope that this helps a little bit, fills in some of the details without having to take too much of our, our synchronous time. Um, and again, this is something that you can use if you want. You don't really have to cover it, although it is on the syllabus. Um, I found that my students have been fine without knowing it at all. Um, if it shows up on a multiple choice question, tell them to guess. Okay. All right. So I'm going to shut this one down, and um, I will talk to you again later.